you guys can always come right up here. All right. How's it going? Have you ever seen anything unbelievable? What's, you haven't seen anything unbelievable? Have you ever seen someone pull their finger off? Or their thumb off? Like, like that? You see that? Is that, is that unbelievable? No? You believe that I just pulled my thumb off? You know how I'm doing it? Don't tell them. How am I doing that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't tell them. How, how am I doing it? You do? How, how am I doing it? <laughs> that's right. So that's unbelievable because I'm not really pulling my thumb off, am I? It's, it's still all there, isn't it? You know, there was a guy in the Bible, and, and his name was Moses, and he saw something that was quite unbelievable. Do you know what he saw that was unbelievable? He saw this bush, okay? And this bush was on fire. But here's the kicker. It wasn't burning up. Boom! <laughs> You're right. But it was crazy because then what happens? Not only is the bush not being burnt up, but it's talking to them. Isn't that incredible? Maybe I should use the word incredible instead of unbelievable. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you guys are going to hear more of that story when you guys get into... Um, into your class. But what I want you to take with you to class is this, okay? That God does some pretty incredible things in our lives, okay? And He does things in ways that we can't even imagine. And you're going to hear about how Moses went through a lot with God and how God did some pretty incredible things, boys. And I want you to be aware of that and be open to that and see what God's going to show you guys when you get to class today, all right? You guys ready? Hey, I heard there's a birthday in the house. Anybody has got a birthday today? Anybody out there have a birthday today? You do? Yeah. It's your birthday today? Yeah. How old are you? Five. You're five? Yeah, you know that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to Caden, will you? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Caden. Happy birthday to you. Woo! All right. Let's pray. Lord God, be with these kids today and be with their teachers. I pray that they learn something incredible about you and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go to class. Our real daring to pray the disciples' prayer Take some time to reflect on all the elements that Jesus gives us. We, you tell us to come. Now is the time to worship. Every moment we have. May it be an act of worship to you. You tell us to come as we are. Imperfect and broken. Here we are, Lord. Here we are to worship you. Here we are praising you. Praising your name, we give you the glory. We deserve none of it. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace, for your love, and for your mercy. We give you this day, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, worship team. So we have come finally 
to the end of the disciples' prayer that we have been talking about for several weeks now. And it's been, I think, a lot, it's, it's been fun for me anyway. <laughs> it's been good uh, digging into what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And this is a prayer that many, many believers know by heart, and we know it uh, um, even in a certain version. I think the King James Version is how we usually say it. Um, so if you will, please pray with me the Lord's Prayer as we get into this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and the power forever. How am I messing that up? Amen. I've done that 22 weeks in a row now. I've botched that. I don't know how I'm doing that. Um, the Lord's Prayer. The Disciples' Prayer. I, and we, and I've been calling it the Disciples' Prayer because this is a prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples to pray. I would really argue that the, Lord's, the true Lord's Prayer is in, in John 17 where the Lord himself is praying this prayer. And, and is wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane over in, in, in what he's about to face. Um, but we will always, and I will always call this the Lord's Prayer. This is still the Lord's Prayer, but really, he gave this as a model for his disciples. And uh, so our big idea for today is going to be thoughtfully pray the disciples' prayer. I, that's what I really want to bring home with you guys this week is to thoughtfully pray this prayer. We can rattle through it. We can even mess it up sometimes without thinking about what these words actually mean. And that's why we have dug so deeply into this. Um, so the path that we're going to take um, to get there is that we're going to talk about where we've been in this. We're going to talk about where we are in this prayer, and then we're going to get to where we're going with this prayer, okay? So everybody tracking with me so far? All right, good. Then let's, let's get right into it, to where we've been, okay? Where we've been. We've talked about the our Father in heaven. So we talked about God's name, right? We rec we're recognizing God as our heavenly Father, and embracing him for who he is, we are recognizing the holiness of God. And then we talked about, hallowed be your name. That means we're recognizing God's name as holy. We looked at the personal name of God, and we know that the personal name of God is Yahweh in the original Hebrew. And this name... They were so careful about using God's name because they don't even use, uh, if, you look, if you were to sit and try to read real Hebrew, they don't even use the vowels when they say his name because they were so afraid they might accidentally use his name in an unworthy manner or take his name in vain. And so it's really a name that you can almost breathe. Yahweh. I mean, you can whisper it. Yahweh. And, and so we, just, we wanted to give you that image of his name, his holiness, and recognizing God as our heavenly Father. So that was our first step in this, in this journey of the disciples' prayer. Okay? Then we moved on to your, to your kingdom come. And that was God's kingdom, God's will. We talked about that. Okay, And we talked about spreading God's kingdom here on earth, which is witnessing and discipling. Okay, Those two go hand in hand. When we witness to some, how many people did you guys witness to at the Godmobile this week? Or at least when you were there, or that you can remember. <clears throat> so you talked, you witnessed to a hundred some people in a week. Okay? Witnessing 
And sharing the gospel is the beginning, okay? Discipling is where we get here at church. When you start coming to church and you're going, well, what is, who is this, you know, okay, I've accepted this Jesus that people have been talking about, and now what do I do with it? Okay, the discipleship is the now what, and I've talked for weeks and weeks and weeks about that, and we're going to keep talking about that over, over time. I'm not going to hammer you over the head with it every single week, but we were going to keep revisiting that because eventually, someday, and hopefully in the next year or so, we're going to have discipleship groups that are working together and growing and building disciples. Scary, I know. Trust me, I know it's scary, because it's scary for me trying to actually do discipleship. It's an action. Can we turn the fans up back there? Get these fans going a little higher? That would be great. Um, but then we talked about your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that means surrendering our will to God's will, right? We surrender our will to God's will, and we, 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 we put our will aside because when we are focused on what God's will is, our will is no longer as important. Our will becomes God's will, if that makes sense. It doesn't mean, that means you're letting go of the things that come between you and God and your relationship with Him and others, and you are letting His will take over your life. I know, it's crazy, because we have these things that we love to hold on to, and, and we, we just don't want to let go of, and we have to learn to do that. Um, I don't remember if I quoted this last week or not. Uh, I know I did a C.S. Lewis quote, but I saw you had the book right there, and it made me think of it. Um, in Mere Christianity, he says, the people who do the most for the kingdom, or the who think the, the no the people who do the most here on earth are the ones who are thinking the most about the next world so the people who do the most in this world or for this world are the ones who are thinking the most about the next world and that's what putting our will aside and putting God's will in front of us and making that the focal point of our lives that is where our will changes when our desire becomes more about doing God's will, we tend to forget about our own will. Make sense? Then, we talked about give us this day our daily bread. That brings us to God's provision. Okay? How God provides for us. And we talked about, we looked at how God has provided in each of our lives. Right? Right? Because God, has God prov not provided for anybody here? He's provided. It might be small. It might be huge. And sometimes the small things are huge. Isn't that, isn't that crazy how that works? Sometimes it can just be somebody just says something just the right way that touches your heart and it totally just makes your day. That's a little tiny blessing that's blown up into something huge because it was from the Lord. Or sometimes people, and I get this a lot, somebody will challenge me with something, or maybe challenge a behavior or an action, and at first, I don't see it as a blessing or a provision, but then the more I think about it, and mull over and pray over it, it turns into this huge provision from God, because it's, it's something that's helping me to grow. And so, and we looked at what our daily bread really is and how it is important to recognize God's provision. Because he says, give us this day our daily bread. So that means, Lord, I'm going to be, I'm hungry. But is that literal food that we're talking about? Sometimes, yes. But other times, daily bread might be the spiritual food that we need. And our spiritual food, hopefully, I'm giving you your spiritual food on Sunday that you need to chew on during the week if I'm really doing my job. And I'm equipping you to take what I fed you into your daily lives. Does that make sense? So we get into that 
with, we, we, we think about our daily bread not just as physical food. Sometimes it is, it really is physical food that we, that we need. But other times it's this, it's this spiritual food that we need that we can feed from the Word of God. And if I don't preach the Word of God, you better hold my feet to the fire because then I'm in trouble and we're all in trouble. So, and I know I've got people who will do it too. And I appreciate that because when you come here, I want to point you to Jesus with everything that's being said. It's not my words. I want God's words to be heard. And that comes from the Word, the Bible. All right. So then... <clears throat> the next week, we got into um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay? And that sermon was everyone needs forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. We all mess up. We looked at how God forgives us. We, we looked at how, how do we ask for forgiveness. We wrestled with those ideas. And how do we extend forgiveness to others, right? And, we, and we, we don't just walk up to the person who's hurt us and said, Bruce, I just want you to know I forgive you, okay? It's okay. And Bruce could be sitting there going, what is he talking about? What did I, did I offend him? Did I do, you know, that's not how forgiveness, giving forgiveness works, right? It doesn't go that way. It's something that you do in your heart. If somebody hurts you or offends you, you have to forgive them in your heart. Otherwise, bitterness will build up in you. By the way, you never didn't do anything to offend me. I just want you to know that. <laughs> um, I was just picking on you. So, but um, we, we get bitterness built up in our hearts when we hold on to unforgiveness. And so God teaches us that we need to always be forgiving people. Remember, we got into the whole discussion about 70 times 7. Well, how many times should I forgive my brother? Is it 7 times? Peter thought he was doing great with 7. Jesus goes, no, 70 times 7. Or if you read the NIV, it's 77 times. The point is, Jesus said, keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Why is that important? That's why we, we wrestled with that. Why is that important? Because of the bitterness. We are so prone to, be, get, to get bitter with people when we don't forgive them. It's not just a duty. It's, a, it's downright a need for a believer to forgive others. Then we got into lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I wrestled with this idea. We looked at the words temptation and tempting. We learned the difference between temptation and testing. Because we looked at, why would Jesus tell us to say, um, why would he tell us to say, lead us not into temptation? Is he indicating that God would tempt us and lead us into temptation? Well, we know that's not true. Why? Because we read the book of James, and it says God cannot be tempted, nor will he lead you into temptation. And so when we dug into the word temptation, we discovered that it was really more about a testing. Lead us not into this testing, or do not lead, let my testing lead me into temptation. And so we have to think more about what that means when we read this. But deliver us from evil. We learn that it's all about the motive behind the testing when we're being tempted. Because we're always being tempted by something. Whether it's food, whether it's porn, whether it's television, whether it's work can be a temptation. Especially if we're a workaholic. Or, you know, time how we spend our time, what we watch in the movies, what we watch on TV, those all can be attempted. You can't even watch a regular program anymore without having something that is not from God being thrown at you. Okay? So we wrestled with that. So then we get to where we are. Where are we in this? 
Where are we in this prayer? Now, I just took you through the whole series in about 10 minutes. Now, I've got my, my grandma. Actually, this was my dad's. My dad, uh, well, actually, no, my grandma gave this to my dad, but he, my dad was a big into the new King James, but he also grew up on the King James. And I found this very interesting. As I was studying the Lord's Prayer, I found this in the Lord's, in, in chapter 6. And it says, in verse 13, let me find it. I'm in Matthew, sorry, Matthew 6, verse 13. Okay, see, this is why I don't read King James. I get lost real quick. Hold on. Oh, here it is. One more page over. Verse 13, it says this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, you get to the NIV, and what does it say? It says, lead us not into temptation. Uh-oh, <clears throat> did we delete something? No. Go to my ESV. I'm going, hmm, what's going on here with this? So I'll go check my ESV, right? And my ESV says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Period. Uh-oh. Did we delete something here, folks? No, we did not. Because I'm going, where did this come from? You know, because we've always said, we've always said it with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I got it that time. <laughs> for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I'm going to literally read from, this is not my words. These are a footnote on this verse 13. Okay? And I find that this is very interesting. Okay? This part of the prayer comes as a footnote. And it says, For yours, and this is how it would sound in the ESV, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is evidently a later scribal addition. Since the oldest and most reliable Greek transcripts lack these words. Which is the reason why these words are omitted from most most modern translations. However, there is nothing theologically incorrect about the wording, nor is it inappropriate to include these words in public prayer. So don't feel bad if we're reading through our Bible, and if you've got a new modern translation, like the NIV, ESV, NLT is the same, um, they omit the, for thine is the king of the kingdom and the power and the glory forever because it wasn't in the original Greek. When we got to King James, he added that in. It was added in by the scribes who were putting the King James Bible together. Now, I'm not criticizing the King James Bible because clearly the, this is very theologically correct. It's okay to have that. But that's the re I'm just trying to illustrate the reason why Newer translations don't have that part of the verse. And you're probably going, why are you telling me all this? Because I, I just think that's important to understand that. I think we need to know that. It's not that it's an incorrect translation. It's not that it's a bad translation. Yes? Question. The King James came after the canonization of Scripture. Unless someone can show me that I'm wrong. I think I'm pretty sure. So they added that in afterwards. And um, so, man, you're going to take me back to church history now. <laughs> so, yeah, and if I'm wrong on that, I will totally take the hit because, uh, yes, yeah, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and even the footnote says it's not wrong to pray that. It's perfectly okay because it lines up with the whole message of the prayer. And so 
if we want to talk about God's glory, right? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's pointing us to who? Yes. Thank you. So it's okay. It's just different. This is not a right or wrong or a right or wrong. It's a, it's a kind of a both and. They both work. Um, so let's look at our actual text for today. Yes, I eventually got to it. First Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 13. Twenty nine, eleven through thirteen. This is David praying uh, for his people, for the assembly of the people, and he says this, verse eleven: "Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all." Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So talking about God's glory is all the way back here with David. Praising God, saying, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power. We've condensed it to fit the prayer, but it's in there. It's in Scripture. It's just in a different spot. So David prays for the Israelites, very similar to what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, or the disciples' prayer, and the words point all to the glory of God. And that's the whole point of it, right? It's not disputing over translations. It's just saying... We're going to point all the glory to God. I don't want to have the glory. I don't deserve any glory. And that's what David was saying. This is a final call. If you think about it, when we put that part in the prayer, this is a final call to humility because it does point all glory to God. We often struggle with our own egos. We want credit for the good things we do. We want to give credit where credit is due. Right? Well, if that's true, it brings up the question, where is the credit due? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Right? The glory is due and the credit is due to God. And the moment we try to take the credit for anything good that we do, that is the moment we lose focus. We lose focus on why we pray this prayer. David is pointing all the credit, all the kudos, all the glory to God. And anything we do that is good it comes from God and not us. All right, jump back to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Any Bible say different than that? Do it all to the glory of God. Man, that's a tough one, isn't it? I'm glad they didn't put that in the Lord's Prayer. But it, guess what? It's still in the Scripture. So it's still something that we really need to live by, right? I mean, if I say I'm a believer, if I say I'm a Christian, I'll tell you what, I wrestle to give God the glory. And, and God has to knock my ego over on a daily basis. He says, you better get rid of that ego, son. I'm going to knock you down again. I love you. <laughs> I love you, but you better lose the ego. You better lose the attitude. Because do it to the glory of God. And so I have to sit and I have to ask myself, is what I'm doing giving God glory? And if it's not, what do I need to change? 
If I'm not giving God glory with my words and my actions and my deeds, what do I need to change? 90% of the time for me, it's my attitude and my focus. Paul reminds us to do everything so that God gets the glory. This takes a truly humble spirit. There's a song by one of my favorite guys. His name is Toby Mack, and he says, if you, want, if you want to steal my show, sit back and watch it go. If you've got something to say, go on and take it away. I'll read it again. If you want to steal my show, sit back and watch it go. If you've got something to say, go on and take it away. Now this is a guy who's up front in front of thousands of people every week singing his songs and, and having a big old crazy loud party type music and he does hip hop and all kinds of stuff and he, he's crazy and wild but he's, he wrote this song because he knew that he needs to have a humble spirit about what he does and if his music is not pointing people to Jesus then he needs to let it go. It's a, it's a wonderful song. It's one of his slower, quieter songs. But what he is saying is, we are a part of something that is way bigger than ourselves. When you come to church and you worship Jesus, you are a part of something that's way bigger than you. When I'm up here and I'm talking to you, I'm being a part of something that's way bigger than me. I don't want you to remember what Pastor Mark said on such and such a day. I want, to, I want you to know what God's saying to you through his word, not through, you know. I mean, he uses people, unrefined, broken, messed up people to share his truth. He does that all through scripture. All the glory needs to go to God. So, where are we going? Where are we going? So when you pray this prayer, the words take our minds and thoughts off ourselves. When you pray this prayer, we are not praying about ourselves. We are simply, purely, and humbly coming before God and giving Him the glory. We recognize Him for who He is. We ask for what we need, and we point the glory to Him. Let's look at Proverbs 22, 25, verse 2. <clears throat> it says, It is the glory of God to conceal things. But the glory of kings is to search things out. In other words, this reflects the idea that Jesus, from Jesus, that the spiritual things we do in private are the most special things to God. Now some of us, I, I, my, I used to have this conversation with my dad, and he's like, well, my faith is private. Part of it, Yes. Part of it, yes. I half agreed with him. But it's also sharing in fellowship with other believers. It's also coming in the gathering to worship together our Jesus. You will be blessed not by putting on a religious show for people. Let me say that again. You will not be blessed by putting on a religious show for people, but by being intimately engaged in prayer to your Heavenly Father who sees what is done in secret. <sighs> Man. That's hard for, people, for a guy with an ego. That's hard for someone who's prideful. That's hard for someone who's self-centered. What's done in secret is what is really truly blessed. The good things. Don't do anything bad in secret. He knows that too. But what I'm saying is, don't neglect that time alone with God. I, I, and I, this is another one of those moments where I need to have a big fat mirror in front of me saying, Mark, 
Do not neglect this time, this quiet time with the Lord. We were in 2-7 this morning, and, and uh, the assurance of guidance came up. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. When should we trust in God? Not just when things are tough. Not just when things aren't going your way. All the time. When things are going good, trust in God. When things are not going good, trust in God. When you're going through whatever it is that you're going through, trust in Him, not your own understanding. Because our own understanding leads us astray. And it's, and it's limited. Our understanding is limited no matter how smart you are. But God's is infinite. All right, Psalm 108, verse 5. I'm just going to read, read it real quick. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. David exalts God above everything. He wants to see God's glory over all the earth. Where is the focus? On God, not David. That's why I, st I, I love our new modern worship songs. But some of our s modern worship songs are very self-centered songs. And, but some of them are still, some of them still point us straight to Jesus. And those are the songs that really we can truly sing. I, like, I love to come, now is the time to worship. Come as you are. You know, we're broken and messed up, and this is the place to be. If you feel like you've got it all together, great. This is still the place to be. If you think you got it all together, I'm sure eventually you're going to find, if you're doing it without Christ, that we don't have it all together. So again, as you pray the Lord's Prayer, or if you are real daring to pray the disciples' prayer, take some time to reflect on all the elements that Jesus gives us. I gave you a lot this morning. I know I threw a lot at you, and we went through a lot of review. But we needed to, because we need to remember why each part of this prayer is so important. When you go out that door this week, thoughtfully pray the disciples' prayer. Thoughtfully. Pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.